Like, what was a typical class that you would take uh, at the University of Chicago? Well, you know, liberal arts school, gets you well-rounded, teaches you how to think, so, you know, I got to school there and I, I took chemistry. Uh-huh. And uh, I took a humanities class. But as far as computer pro programming, there no, was no. I, 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 it wasn't until my probably the end of my second year of college that I decided I would actually pursue a degree related to computer science, which was math. Did they just stick you in a room with computers and say, this is computer science class, and then you just sort of screw around on whatever? I, I did take some computer science classes. They did have some. Whatever yeah. sort of iteration of ARPA, DARPAnet yeah, was going it, on know, at that time? It was a little bit more theoretical, you know, theory-based stuff. There were some practical classes in, in programming, but it was not like today where, you know, there's lots of classes where you can actually sit down, form a group with other people, work on, say, a game project, and have, it, have an endpoint and something practical you could show other people. Hey, I did this. Check it out. It's cool. Do you, do you laugh now at, at people who are getting into quote unquote programming where it's just like, well, you're really just using other platforms to build things rather than actually having to design, like write your own codes and stuff. I went to a, um, this is really nerdy, I went to a double feature of Tron and Wrath of Khan. <laughs> and we, it was Tron and Khan. And at the Tron, <laughs> Steven Lisberger, the director, came out with all these guys that had done the effects for Tron, and they said, like, yeah, in 1980, we didn't have, like, now you can just plug things into existing software. We actually had to write mathematical formulas to create these images and just sort of hope that they worked. Did you, did you sort of feel the same thing was true in the, in the by 87, 88? Uh, probably not. You know, it's, it's like, the thing that's cool about um, working on computer games is you're, al you're always given a set of tools. Back then, the tools were much simpler. But even if you look at Zork, you know, the tools they had, it was just text, right? It's just their imagination. But what they did with it was beyond what most people would do, and they expressed themselves really creatively. And that happens in engineering all the time. It's you know, like you start with some set of tools that, that get you kind of off the ground, and then that's how you use them that you know, decides whether you did something cool or not. And it was the same back then as now. It's just the focus is different. You know, back then I took a class that was, you know, it was like uh, writing assembly language, and you actually you actually could see the, the bits in the transit, you know, you, you could write it out, like what would happen with the registers in the, in the computer to make it add two numbers together, which is very simple, but I think most computers, you know, most people who get into programming now don't even bother with that part because it's taken for granted so much. Do you think that's an important thing to know at this point? I, I do because that's what I went through, you know. Um, and it gave me a real fundamental understanding of how the machine actually worked. You know, there, you, you, you use a Mac or a PC or a, a phone today, and it's got such a cool, slick interface, and there's so many layers between the user and what's actually happening on the, with the ones and zeros in the hardware that nobody really thinks about it. So it's kind of like magic. Right. It's only going to get more like magic, you know? So understanding, de demystifying that magic, I, yeah, I think that's important. So then in 1991, you decide uh, it's your senior year, you're going to start Bungie Software. So what, how did you, how'd you come up with a name? <laughs> yeah, it's a long story. Is it a long, gross story that we can't tell in front of kids? It's a long story. I've sworn to secrecy. All right. OK. <laughs> well, that makes it mysterious. So that's actually more interesting. Um, so you start programming, and you start uh, an Operation Desert Storm themed version of combat. I didn't actually have a slide of Operation Desert Storm, so I made this last night, <laughs> which I assume is pretty, probably pretty close. Nailed it. To, uh, to what No, it was. that's way better. Dude, if you were around back then, we would have done some, so some that real guy, stuff. That guy, is it? You drew that? I, I did. I, I did but using my finger on the trackpad in Photoshop, just having to draw, like, yeah, I'll make this little guy's fingers little sticks. So it was, that's what I did from uh, 12 to 1245. Nice. Last night, just in case you were wondering. Um, so nice to know you care. So it's true. So so you make this awesome uh, Operation Desert Storm. Um, then what happens? What do you do? You sell it? Do you do you give it to people? How do you spread it around? Well, that's when I sort of had my little moment of truth. I, I had gone around interviewing for jobs, got a couple of job offers doing computer stuff, and I had written this game, which was started off just as you know, hey, I'm just going to write you know my own version of this combat game for the Mac, yeah, for fun. And uh, you know, I had a, a friend who was an artist. He did some art for me, and it actually, you know, made an actual game. And I was like, oh, maybe I could sell this. So I, there was one, one day I was at home at my parents' house, sitting on the couch talking to my dad, asking him what he, 
what he thought I should do because I was trying to decide, should I take a job? Should I, should I try starting a company? And uh, I, I realize now that he's like master of reverse psychology or something because he, he looked at me and he said, you know what, why don't you go take a job, get a couple years of experience, then start your company, which, which kind of made me go out the next Sounded day. Sounded horrible. Yeah, like no way I'm going to go out and start this thing right now. So. Also, I don't want to gloss over the fact that I, it's funny that there was a time when you could write that someone would actually write a game just for a Mac. <laughs> it doesn't even seem like, I guess na you know, now that it's on the upswing, there was a period of time where if you bought a Mac, people are always like, well, no one writes software for Mac. You have to, you know, you have to figure out, it's all, it's all PC, son, they would say yep. condescendingly. Yep, they would. But you actually did, you actually were writing specifically for Mac and then ultimately ended up switching over to Microsoft, you know, like selling uh, to Microsoft, but we'll talk about that in a minute. <laughs> um, so in 1992, you hook up with a guy named Jason Jones, and you guys decide to make uh, a game called Minotaur. And this was the first game that you wrote it, where you actually had to use, I think the technical term was a modem, is that correct? <laughs> or Apple Talk, I think it was Apple Talk at the time. So you use Apple Talk. It was a multiplayer modem. only game. It was, it, was, it was some sort, it was a groupware, basically. Yeah, it was a little ahead of its time. So how did you... How did you even think to do that? If, I mean, how many people were really networked at that time? Well, not a lot. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't sell too many. But it was a lot of fun. It was one of my favorite games. I mean, it's like you run around this dungeon picking up stuff, and it had this crazy, crazy interface where basically your left hand was on the keyboard, and, you know, controlling your inventory. So you'd have like weapons and spells and these magic items, and your other hand was like running you around this. 2D maze, so it was like it was like playing the piano, like you'd sit there running around picking stuff up, and then when you had enough stuff, you're like, all right, I'm gonna go and kill you, and you're like, boom, you'd be dead. I, I always love the art behind the geekiness stories. Like comparing it to <laughs> piano was awesome. Did, did, so was when people are networked, they're they're just seeing their first person perspective. They see no, it wasn't. It was not. It was totally 2D. So they're seeing their little section of the maze. They might teleport over to you. They could, you know, they'd see themselves and you, and you'd see them beating you to death. So how long did it take, how long does it take to write a program like that in 1992? Uh, you know, not that long. <laughs> the, the dev cycles back then were months, not years, you know. Wow. Okay, so 1993, you make Pathways, which rave reviews, it wins a ton of awards, uh, Macworld's Game Hall of Fame, the Mac User 100, Inside Mac, Games Adventure, Game of the Year. Did you know you won all those awards? I do now. Congratulations. <laughs> They're going to come out and present them to you here, live on stage, uh, 14 years after the fact. Awesome. So, so what was Pathways all about? Because like what, 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 it seems like with every game, you try to reimagine, you don't just manufacture the same stuff over, you say, you know, what new thing can I add, or what in what way can I tweak this so it's you know, as cutting edge as possible? What, what was that with Pathways? Well, Pathways was the first game that we did that was 3D. Mm -hmm. So this was back when, this was before Doom had come out, sort of more of the Castle Wolfenstein era. I think we, I think we have Pathways into Darkness, which, oh no, there's Minotaur. That's, Minotaur. That's the Minotaur box right there, if anyone's looking for it. And there is Pathways into Darkness. Yeah, so it was, uh, it, it was a uh, first-person perspective adventure game. So you'd run around with a little gun, picking up objects, defeating monsters, trying to you know, play through this adventure to get to the end. Did you ever play D&D? A little bit. I, was gonna be like, I do have, a, a, I have a bunch of dice. I got a whole big thing of dice. I That's got 20-sided die. Yeah. I used to get beaten up because I would take dice to school. Uh -huh. I never you played D&D school. Lot, but for some, yeah, a lot. A yeah. lot. I got stuffed in a trash can. And my Dungeon Master's Guide was used as a plunging device to stuff me into the trash can harder. That was a sick irony. Um, <laughs> but uh, then, so then, Marathon Trilogy, you start getting to more 3D stuff. There's face mapping, so people can actually take their face and stick it on the game as well. Really? That's what